I'm Marielle Villeray, Program Development Director for Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation at the Graduate Center, the new home for the Institute for Retired Professionals Program, the IRP. We are so pleased to have launched this lifelong peer learning program at the Graduate Center in May. Fridays at 3 is a series of lectures organized by members of the IRP and open to all. This is one of the many initiatives within the IRP and within our office at the Graduate Center through which we aim to expand minds and connection between students, faculty, and the public realm. Today we kick off the fall lineup of Fridays at 3 with a lecture by Harold Holzer, who, as director of the Roosevelt House Policy Institute at Hunter College, represents the mission of creating intellectual exchange and public engagement across CUNY campuses and into our communities. I'm going to welcome Harold and Leslie to turn on their video and join me on the screen. Wonderful. So um, before I hand off to Leslie to introduce Harold, I want to notify attendees that you can submit your questions for the Q&A portion of today's program using the tool on the lower register of your Zoom window. It looks like two overlapping conversation bubbles. Harold will be taking questions at the end of his talk. And now I'm going to hand over the mic to Leslie Herman, the co-chair of Fridays at Three, to introduce Harold in today's talk. Thank you, Marielle. The IRP is delighted to have Harold as our speaker for the inaugural Fridays at Three. As Marielle mentioned, Harold is currently the director of Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. He will be speaking on his new and timely book, the President versus the Press, the endless battle between the White House and the media, from the founding fathers to fake news. Harold Holzer is first and foremost a renowned Lincoln scholar. He has written or edited 54, 54 books on Abraham Lincoln, notably Lincoln and the Power of the Press. See a theme here which won the 2015 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize and the wonderful Lincoln at Cooper Union. Mr. Holzer served as script consultant for Steven Spielberg's film Lincoln, for which he also wrote the companion volume for young adults, How Abraham Lincoln Ended Slavery in America. P.S. You don't have to be a young adult to enjoy this book. The recipient of many accolades and awards, Mr. Holzer was for six years the chairman of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Foundation, appointed by President Clinton. In 2008, he was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President George W. Bush. There's another long list of awards which I won't enumerate or we won't have time to hear Harold speak. But he accomplished all of this while serving for 23 years as Senior Vice President of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where he is now a trustee. The President versus the Press, according to the New York Times Book Review last Sunday, offers us a panoramic survey of the most contentious President on press brawls from the past two and a quarter centuries. Let's let the author tell us about them. Harold. Thank you, Leslie. It's a great honor to be the inaugural Fridays at Three speaker and also to a particular honor and pleasure to be welcomed by my friend of many years, I think at this point, several decades, Leslie Herman, whose own good works in expanding history education to students and teachers na nationwide is legendary and much appreciated and still having an impact. Um, I might have been a member of the IRP. In fact, um, had I, when I retired from the Met in 2015, um, I did not know that I would almost immediately be uh, appointed to Roosevelt House. So in a sense, though denied an IRP life, I, I'm in the CUNY family to be sure. 
So I feel like I'm speaking to colleagues and friends throughout the, the CUNY family, um, and I'm delighted. Uh, Leslie was kind enough to say that the book is timely. Um, I hope so. Um, as we continue to watch and ponder, and I guess get agitated by no matter what side of the aisle politically that you occupy, agitated by political press coverage with less than 40 days to go to a consequential presidential election. Of course, they're all consequential. We are um, perhaps believing that we're living in the most heated partisan age ever, um, maybe absent the Civil War itself, that press coverage has never been more politically driven, more inaccurate, more clouded and colored by partisan affiliation and, uh, and doctrine. And um, if you think that, my book argues the opposite. It would argue that what's old is new again or vice versa, that this has been going on almost since the dawn of the presidency and the birth of, of newspapers in the United States. Who was the first president to be irritated and insulted by, by the press? Well, it was the first president, George Washington. I will, I'll start with him and, and progress chronologically, if I may. But before I do, I want to also say that the other theme, the underlying theme, or I guess a secondary theme that runs through the book, is the suggestion or the argument that the presidents who have been the best communicators, regardless of their politics, the best communicators have been those who have mastered the best available communications technologies or um, created the best communications technologies to reach people outside of the filter of professional journalism. And as we go along through this chronological review, I'll, I'll, point, them, I'll point them out to you. And yes, uh, as, as Leslie said, I did write a book six years ago called Lincoln and the Power of the Press, focusing on Abraham Lincoln, whom I revisit in the new book, but, um, and hopefully with a slightly new uh, analysis. But Leslie is right, this is both a prequel and a sequel, at least in chronological sequence. I thought, well, Lincoln occupied a unique place in his relation to journalism at the apex of what I'll show to be partisanship in coverage. Um, but there is a precedent, uh, there is a history to that point. And of course, there is the history that followed for the next 150 years, which was in some ways different, in some ways the same. All right, enough of the scene setting. Let's go to the presidents. Well, George Washington had a, an unaccustomed and unprecedented, never to be repeated, multi-year honeymoon with journalism. And of course he was the quintessential, universally adored American hero. Um, elected unanimously by the electors as our first president in 1789. And for the first three years of his first term, the subject of universal approbation. Uh, he was a secular saint. He was a living symbol of a new nation. Well, um, Thomas Jefferson, who was then Washington's own Secretary of State, thought that the unfettered praise had gone on long enough. Yes, while he was a member of Washington's cabinet, he thought it might be a good idea to start an anti-federalist newspaper in Philadelphia, the nation's capital. So he importuned a New York editor with Republican leanings, pro-France leanings like Jefferson, named Philip Freno, to give up his New York job and head to Philly to start an anti-Washington newspaper. Think of it. This comes within the cabinet. And Jefferson admitted it to Washington, said he thought there should be a meaningful debate on issues of federal versus state power and British versus French tilt in foreign policy. Well, not only did Jefferson make the invitation, but he provided Freno, 
with a $200 a year job, not a bad salary at the time, in the State Department as a translator to provide a subvention so he could successfully transition from New York to Philadelphia. Well, as one might expect, the Republican paper under Freno, by the way, he'd been James Madison's roommate at college, so he, he uh, absorbed Republican theology early, began criticizing Washington, not just on policy, and here's where it got irritating to Washington, on personal matters as well. And then a second anti-federalist paper was launched in Philadelphia by no less than a man named Benjamin Franklin Bache. He was the grandson of Washington's revolutionary counter uh, a friend and colleague, Benjamin Franklin. But the paper showed none of that family connection. It went after Washington as well. Both papers now pounding him on issues like his monarchical tendencies, his wish to be feted on his birthday, the, the expensive carriage that he used to tool about Philadelphia. Um, this is beyond politics. They even accused Washington of, um, of stealing from the federal treasury, in effect, padding his expense accounts. They accused him of bad acts during the Revolutionary War. And even when Washington rather heroically mounted up and went to Western Pennsylvania to put down the Whiskey Rebellion, the anti-Washington press said, well, he broke the law by being out of the Capitol while Congress was in session. This continued all through Washington's second term and by the, toward the end of the second term, he decided he'd had enough. And he began working on what became the biggest scoop uh, in newspapers of the late 18th century, his farewell address. You've all heard of it. It wasn't really an address, it was a message printed in one newspaper in Philadelphia um, and then republished, of course, around the country. Well, we all remember it as an expression of um, being wary of abuses of power and uh, interpreted as a way for Washington to establish the two-term precedent to discourage uh, monarchical tendencies in future administrations. Well, I went back and looked at a draft of that message that he sent to Alexander Hamilton for editorial suggestions. And in it, Washington made pretty clear why he was actually giving up the, the, the presidency. And it was not just because uh, he wanted to go back to Mount Vernon. It was because, as he put it, Gazettes of the United States have teemed with all the invective that disappointment, ignorance of facts, and malicious falsehoods could invent to misinterpret my politics and affections, to wound my reputation and feelings, and to weaken, if not entirely destroy, that confidence you had been pleased to repose in me. It was virulent abuse he said in this draft that was part, at least partly inspired his decision to give up the presidency. Alexander Hamilton perhaps wisely said, you should take that self-pitying paragraph out of your message so it did not come to light until generations later. But there you have it, the first president giving up the ghost in the wake of what he considered to be not only malicious news, but fake news. John Adams I deal with in the press in the book as well. And uh, for anyone who worries or thinks that Donald Trump is the most abusive president who has ever dealt with journalists, I reintroduce you to John Adams, Washington's successor, who signed and enforced a federal law, the Sedition Act, that made it a crime to ridicule the president of the United States. Let's not tell President Trump, um, but Adams not only signed it, he ordered his attorney general, does this sound familiar, to prosecute at least 17 what I would call show trials, putting anti-federalist newspaper men before federal judges, and in many cases, fining them and imprisoning them for their offenses against 
John Adams. Um, awful. Uh, pro, one journalist wrote, it's time to take our pencils to save our lives, turn them into toothpicks. That was the greatest censorship and fear mongering and chilling factor ever applied to newspapers. And Adams did it with relish. Think about this for a minute as we contemplate a, um, a change in the balance of the US Supreme Court. In the days when Adams was enforcing this law, the courts were 100% Federalist. They had only been appointed by Adams and Jefferson. So what chance did a Republican editor have in the wake of appealing against a clearly, even a clearly unconstitutional law like the Sedition Act, which flew in the face of the First Amendment guarantee that Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of the speech or the press. Predictably, one of the greatest critics of this act was Thomas Jefferson. Um, perhaps because one of his greatest press defenders, a man named James Callender, a Scottish-born pamphleteer and propagandist, had in fact been imprisoned in Richmond and horror upon horrors in an integrated prison, uh, a, 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 a front that Callender never forgot plus find uh, a handsome sum for attacking Adams. Jefferson railed against the Sedition Act, but let's look a little bit closer at why. Uh, as always with Jefferson, his responses and his actions are sometimes uh, a little bit different. His ideals and his practices don't always converge. Jefferson opposed it for political reasons, but really not because he thought newspapers should have an open path to criticism. He just thought typically that the federal government had no right to prosecute journalists. He was perfectly fine with state authorities prosecuting newspapers for libel. So when he becomes president in 1800, in 1801, he is perfectly fine with state courts um, cracking down on on criticism. In fact, the famous uh, appeals case on the issue of state prosecution of journalists was conducted in Albany, New York with Alexander Hamilton as the appeal attorney, uh, winning a decision that in fact made it much more difficult to accuse journalists of libel simply for criticizing public officials. A landmark case that I think was almost as big in the development of my story as Peter Zenger. So we have Jefferson, who then of course is abused by the Federalist press during and throughout his two terms as president. And Jefferson criticizes the press, but again with Jefferson, remember this is the man who said, um, th who wrote the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, but in practice enslaved some human beings. Um, Jefferson says the press is the toxin of liberty, the warning guard, the, the, the guardian against abuse. Um, if he had to choose between government and journalism, he would choose journalism. Well, that was theory. In practice, Jefferson um, fought back against the press with intensity. And he also failed to understand something that some of his successors did. And that is, if you do have journalists in your, in your corner, you'd better take care of them. Jackson knew that, Lincoln knew that, but Jefferson didn't. And I'll give you the case in point. The aforementioned James Callender, who had gone to jail for defending Jefferson and criticizing Adams. When he gets out of prison in the Jefferson presidency, he asks Thomas Jefferson for a reward, a job as postmaster of Richmond, his hometown. Now, why wouldn't Jefferson do it? Federalists had held that job since the beginning of the presidency. It would have been easy for him to give the job to Calendar. Yes, he was a drinker, allegedly a reprobate, but he was Jefferson's reprobate. Well, Jefferson didn't see that. And he said, no. What did Calendar do? Well, the first thing he did was leave his pro-Jefferson paper and join an anti-Jefferson paper. And suddenly he became a uh, fiery Federalist. Doesn't take much to convert journalists in those days. Um, 
What else did he do? He wrote an incendiary, sensational pamphlet, the, the very document that accused Thomas Jefferson of the ultimate hypocrisy, talking about the equality of all, but at the same time, conducting a long time affair, if you want to call it that, with an underage African-American whom he owned, of course, Sally Hemings. Well, we all know the story now, thanks to Fawn Brody and Annette Gordon-Reed, but it was Callender, the disgruntled journalist, who paid back Jefferson's indifference by writing that and, in effect, injuring, deservedly, Jefferson's personal reputation for almost all of the rest of American history. At the end of his life, Thomas Jefferson said, all I read in newspapers now is the advertisements. Those are the only truths to be found in the newspaper. Like presidents one and two, president number three ended his long life really reviling newspapers. But like George Washington, who read aloud from newspapers until his last illness when he was no longer able to speak, Thomas Jefferson, who disdained newspapers, who hated them in a certain way, apparently never threw them out. Because if you look deeply into his monumental gift to the Library of Congress of his whole personal library of books included in that bequest were thousands of newspapers that he could never bear to throw away. Well, I don't write about every president in the book that would have taken 20 years, uh, which I don't think I have, and a few thousand pages, the patience for which I'm sure you don't have. So I skipped to Andrew Jackson. Why? Because Jackson was the first president to openly use friendly editors as part of his advisory group. The famous kitchen cabinet was composed in part of editors. Jackson rewarded loyal editors with very lucrative printing jobs, including printing the congressional record, which were not printed with government funds until the Lincoln era. He made one uh, friendly editor, Amos Kendall, postmaster general. And this will sound familiar. What is the first thing Kendall did? He talked about banning anti-Jackson newspapers from the post office and from the postal service. Another journalist, <coughs> excuse me, Isaac Hill, became comptroller of the currency. And as Jackson lost his um, affection for his own official cabinet, he increasingly used the kitchen cabinet and the journalists as his key advisors in his fights against the Bank of the United States in his quest for a second term. He brought in a, a really strange young man named Francis Preston Blair, uh, sepulchral, uh, I shouldn't use a word I can't pronounce, ghostly pale, emaciated, um, brought him from the West uh, to work for him in Washington. And Blair wound up um, writing his veto messages, his presidential uh, uh, vetoes, his, his uh, uh, working on his reelection campaign, a journalist and editor, while he published a pro-Jackson newspaper, setting another precedent. By the Jackson era, newspapers were openly uh, sometimes violently partisan, advocating Jacksonian democracy or opposing it and supporting the evolving Whig Party, two visions of America, um, and fighting it out in the press and writing stories about the same event that people saw with their own eyes from totally political partisan perspectives. Back in the in the wilds of Illinois in a tiny mill town called New Salem, a young man named Abraham Lincoln becomes the village postmaster. And one of the benefits of that otherwise uninteresting and ill-paying job is that young Lincoln gets to see all of the newspapers that come in from around the country to the residents of Springfield from the cities that they had left and emigrated from. They still get their original hometown papers. Lincoln reads them first. He becomes a passionate reader of newspapers because of his opportunities as postmaster to kind of illicitly sneak into people's mail. 
And eventually Lincoln is gripped by the Whig point of view and begins writing for and selling subscriptions to Illinois' leading Whig newspaper. While Abraham Lincoln moves to Springfield, the rest is history, but the press history is rather interesting. He befriends that Whig newspaper for the rest of his career. In fact, it becomes a Republican paper when Lincoln becomes a Republican. He later rewards its editor with a military job during the Civil War. But that newspaper office is his headquarters. He hangs out there. He has his speeches written there, uh, uh, printed there, uh, set in type. He sits in his favorite chair there on the day he receives word that he's been nominated for president. Um, by the same token, the Democratic paper is not only loyal to his lifetime rival, Stephen Douglas, Douglas is an investor in the Democratic papers of Illinois. By the time of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, we have stenographers recording their talks, but printing varying interpretations of what they said. Um, fake news? Well, you be the judge. After the first debate, the Republican press wrote, after he finished, Lincoln was carried off from the, from the platform in triumph by his supporters. The Democratic paper wrote, Lincoln had performed so badly and was so exhausted that he had to be carried off by his loyal supporters. Well, Lincoln rides a, a crest of support to the presidency with great uh, backing by the Republican press and fierce opposition by the Democratic press. I'm not even going to go into the Southern press because it's sort of a third leg of the tripod. I want to I want to keep the focus on the partisan press. And in the early days of his administration, he authorizes the military to crack down on newspapers in the border states of Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland to prevent them from joining the Confederacy. Well, you might say there's a legitimacy in that kind of crackdown. Um, in a wave of secession, uh, not yet outright rebellion. But then after the rebellion starts, he really intensifies the crackdown. I'll give you one fascinating example. In Baltimore, an editor named Francis Key Howard writes that the Union Army had uh, been uh, ill-mannered and worse to women and children during the Battle of Bull Run. Well, the Army promptly closes down his newspaper and throws Mr. Howard into Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor. Well, he was just one of many to be thrown into military prisons without trial, many editors. Why do I talk about Howard? Because of the irony of the fact that Fort McHenry was the place where his grandfather, Francis Scott Key, saw the Star Spangled Banner waving um, in the, amidst the shelling by the British in the War of 1812. Well, here was his grandson, in Fort McHenry looking out, a prisoner for attacking the Union Army and the Lincoln administration in print, not with, uh, not with bullets and shells. After the Battle of Bull Run, which the Union expected to win and thus end the rebellion, there was a, a, another a whipsawing event that really threatened the Union forces. The first 90-day and 100-day volunteer terms ran out. And there was a great uh, depression, uh, emotional depression within the ranks because of that loss. Lincoln asked the Republican newspapers to urge people to re-enlist. But the Democratic press, many of them, urged people not to re-enlist, to give up the suppression of the rebellion, to let the South go off without further bloodshed. What happened next? set the table for Lincoln's policy against anti-Union press for the rest of the Civil War. Immediately, the post office refused to carry the newspapers that offered such advice. The army threw newspapers off trains. Editors were summoned from their beds and dragged to Washington to face inquisition. Many of the newspapers were shut down. Again, the editors put in prison. And where did all these things happen? In New York City, a democratic town where Lincoln wanted to maintain support for the war effort. This went on throughout the war 
with interruptions only for election campaign periods. Um, and in 1864, as Lincoln was uh, contemplate, well, he was just nominated for a second term, he personally signed an order closing down the leading Democratic newspaper in New York, the New York World, merely for printing a false proclamation. The editor, Manton Marble, very nearly was sent to Fort Lafayette in Brooklyn Harbor. But his newspaper was shut down for days until the journalistic community in New York, interestingly Democratic and Republican alike, petitioned the White House to say that his offense hardly warranted such pushback. Manton Marble got out and resumed attacks on Lincoln, many of them racist in nature. Again, Lincoln allowed a pause because of the campaign. But Lincoln closed down more than new 200 newspapers during the Civil War, the greatest pushback against guaranteed press freedom in the history of the United States. And his argument was the Constitution provides that in the case of rebellion, the writ of habeas corpus may be suspended. Lincoln suspended it by executive order. Congress later ratified his decision and the crackdowns continued. Lincoln's old nemesis in Illinois, the Chicago Times, the editor arrested, the paper closed down. How do you justify it, asked a group of New York Democrats. This is despotism, this is tyranny. Lincoln said evocatively, must I shoot a simple soldier boy for desertion and spare the head of a wily agitator who induces him to desert? He also said, that he was willing to sacrifice a limb to save the body. In other words, prosecute press offenses to save the Constitution itself. By the way, his actions are still being debated. I suppose you can look back in hindsight and say he overdid it. And I think I would agree. But Lincoln did not know in 1861, two and three, how the Civil War would end. He did not know that emancipation would be sustained and then enhanced by the 13th Amendment. He was fighting for the life and soul of the American dream, and newspaper freedoms went by the wayside in that struggle. By the way, how did Lincoln feel about um, newspapers who irritated him? And I should add, he gave lots of journalists federal jobs after he was elected. Um, that was part of the system. He was at a reception one day and heard uh, the wife of his Navy secretary say to another party goer, should we rely on newspapers? Lincoln, who could not resist a straight line, came over and said, Mrs. Wells, yes, we should, because newspapers lie and then they rely. It may be a joke, but I think Lincoln believed that the opposition press was guilty of, yes, fake news. And yes, they were enemies of the union, and in his case, he prosecuted them. Well, things changed in the 20th century um, as partisan newspapers yielded to, I guess, front page journalism, which sometimes um, became uh, yellow journalism. I skipped next to Teddy Roosevelt, who was the perfect president for his era, an era when the front page was everything. The big news story was everything. And just as uh, uh, T.R.'s daughter said he expected to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral and the baby at every christening. Theodore Roosevelt also expected to be on the front page of every newspaper every day of the week. And many times he was satisfied with the result. Journalists who covered him called him the master press agent of all time. They enjoyed unprecedented access to the president. For one thing, T.R. gave them a White House press room for the first time. Second of all, he invited him into his new headquarters, the newly built Oval Office. In fact, every day when he received his shave from his barber uh, at 1 p.m., he as an inveterate multitasker, he couldn't just sit still and be shaved, he invited the press corps in to pepper him with questions while his face was lathered, and the journalists loved it. It was off the record. And if you went on the record with something TR wasn't willing to share, he, you became a member of what he called the Ananias Club. Ananias Club. 
named after a bib biblical figure who had been struck dead by, for lying to St. Peter. The journalist got back at him by asking the most provocative questions just as the barber brought the straight edged razor closest to his neck because they knew that Roosevelt would jump up and gesticulate and rip off his apron and bib when the questions got heated. But they loved him and he was on the front page. He mastered the art and named the phenomena of trial balloons, leaks, swamping, which is when you hear someone else is gonna get a big story out, you put a bigger story out and, and minimize their press efforts. Um, he, was a, he was a public relations genius. It didn't always guarantee him political success, but I will say that while he was dominating the front pages, we should never forget that he also encouraged all but collaborated with serious investigative long form journalists like Ida Tarbell and Lincoln Steffens with whom he worked closely to do pieces about Standard Oil, about the meatpacking industry that ballasted his progressive reform agenda. But Roosevelt could be pretty ruthless about journalists. When he was finished with the likes of Tarbell and Steffens and Ray Stannard Baker, he gave a memorable speech to a press club calling them muckrakers. We know them as the muckrakers today, but it's considered a compliment. Roosevelt didn't mean it as a compliment. He meant that they were wallowing in the mud of negativity. Wilson is my next president, and there was quite a different atmosphere when Wilson um, became president. Those who had covered TR said it was like going from a foundry to a convent to be exposed to the professorial uh, and dry uh, personality of Woodrow Wilson. Wilson, to his credit, introduced the first regular news conference, and he conducted hundreds of them, although they diminished in frequency as his illnesses became uh, more serious and also in the wake of World War I. On the negative side, well, he was brutal to black journalists. He only saw one that I could find, and he, was, he basically threw him out of the office, even as his, he was resegregating the federal bureaucracy. During World War I, he created um, an official censorship and propaganda arm called the Committee for Public Information, which we remember somewhat in a rose-colored way as creating all those wonderful World War I recruiting posters and newsreels. But in fact, it also cracked down on the free flow of journalism. The Espionage Act of 1918 made sure that there was no news that could compromise the American war effort against the Hun. And some newspaper men were again arrested and their print operations closed down if they questioned the war. Again, to his credit, Wilson did shut down the CPI as soon as the war ended. And I will share with you a story that I wasn't uh, prescient enough to include in the book. It's a long book. I couldn't include every great anecdote. Here's one that fell by the wayside. In 1918, Wilson went to Paris to lead the negotiations for an official armistice. He took a big press contingent with him. So that goes on the, the credit roll for Woodrow Wilson. Um, but for a time, he disappeared from view. No one knew why, because it was kept totally secret. In fact, Wilson came down with what was called the Spanish flu and apparently had a very severe case. May have been delirious for a time, but never shared the information with the press, establishing a new tradition of keeping health issues out of the newspapers. Uh, we see that even today. Why did I omit it? Well, I thought, who would want to read about a pandemic? Um, it's ancient history. It's never going to be repeated. Yes, that's why I left it out. The next president I covered is Franklin Roosevelt. And of course, back to the CUNY Association, I feel a special uh, closeness to FDR these days, having spent five years uh, in Roosevelt House. But Roosevelt House, as many of you I think know, is the New York City townhouse that FDR's mother built for him and Eleanor as a wedding present. 
it just came with a hitch, and that is that Sarah Delano Roosevelt moved in with the happy couple and their children when it was opened in 1908. They lived there for 25 years. They conducted political campaigns, including the presidential campaign from Roosevelt House. And Roosevelt, from the time of his governorship, where he held regular press conference, was an extraordinary communicator. But part of his success depended on a ruse about his health. For one thing, he commissioned Liberty Magazine to write an article about his health because Herbert Hoover was convinced he could use the fact that he had polio and had endured polio as a negative. The Liberty Magazine writers went to two doctors who said un, you know, untruthfully that Roosevelt was not only completely recovered, but that he had perfect health in other respects, when of course by this time he already had dangerously high blood pressure and in fact could not walk. The, the writer wrote a letter to FDR that I found that said, well, we certainly got away with a Liberty Magazine article. Um, Roosevelt also benefited all through his presidency from what began as an unofficial gentleman's agreement not to photograph him in his wheelchair, trying to simulate walking on braces and crutches, or being lifted in and out of automobiles. No pictures in the machine, boys, Roosevelt always said, but it wasn't really necessary. I looked for an explanation. Was there a rule? Was there a, a union meeting? No, most photographers just said he was a nice man. He was trying to help the country. We didn't want to hurt him. And this was in an era when the publishers never gave a majority of endorsements to Roosevelt, not in any of his four elections. And when some Republican newspaper publishers sent photographers into the White House press corps, specifically to get a picture of him in his wheelchair, there was always a, a photographer nearby to jostle him with his elbow uh, at just the moment he was taking the picture. And the pact was kept with very, very rare exceptions. I think there are only five photographs of Roosevelt in his wheelchair in the entire FDR library collection. Well, Roosevelt's presidency was not just about suppression. It was also about access. Roosevelt held 998 news conferences during his presidency. And those who think he was faltering after Yalta need only look at the press conference he held on a battleship coming home in command, exhausted perhaps, but still a master um, puppet master with the press. He even held a convincing press conference the day before he died at Warm Springs, Georgia. Now these press conferences were first. Dozens and dozens of reporters crowded into the Oval Office, FDR seated behind his desk, trading jokes and jibes. And I know some of us are upset when President Trump says that's a nasty question, or you're a nasty woman, or that's a wise guy question. Roosevelt used to say, I'm going to revive my cousin's Ananias Club, or that was a ridiculous question, go stand in the corner. That wasn't on camera, it wasn't on tape, but it sent a message just the same. Roosevelt was the first of the communications geniuses I wanted to talk about, because in addition to masterfully handling the press and being in their affection, he also went around them with 28 unforgettable to the people who listened, fireside chats, direct communications to the American people on the issues of the day, both the economic crisis and the war effort. Reading them today is not enough. Hearing them on the FDR library website is what reminds you, even though the patrician accent is kind of off-putting and remarkable, the, the talent he developed for speaking softly on the radio as if he was in the homes of the people who tuned in, and that's exactly the effect he had, is nothing short of astonishing. He was as skillful as the greatest radio performers of the day, Jack Benny and Bing Crosby, uh, who seemed to be chatting and not performing from a stage or from behind a rostrum. I'll give you one story about the effect. A young writer, in the Federal uh, Writers Project in Chicago one August night 
was stuck in an awful traffic jam, upset that he was going to miss the fireside chat of the evening. And remember, they're only 28 in 12 years. They were not frequent occurrences. The cab driver, of course, had it on, and the rider began to listen. But he was so frustrated about being in this traffic jam, that he, and it was so hot. He said, I can't stand it anymore. I'm leaving. Uh, he got out, and he started walking down this boulevard toward home. Well, every car that was stopped along this traffic congestion had its windows open and was tuned in to FDR's fireside chat. And the writer recalled that all through the way, all along the way back to his home, he never missed a word of Franklin Roosevelt. The writer went on to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. His name was Saul Bellow. Roosevelt was a master of the medium, but yes, he also cracked down on the press in World War II. Loose lips, he reminded people, sink ships. And the communications with the press, the press conferences diminished as he traveled the world to seek victory against the Axis. But he remained a, a pre, the preeminent communicator of his time. And of course, for the longest time, any president had served or will serve. Similarly, John F. Kennedy befriended journalists all through his life, played golf with them, palled around with them. And in return, most of them kept the secrets of his extramarital affairs and his own health issues, Addison's disease, a terrible bad back. They romanticized his back problems with those famous rocking chair photographs. But that was not enough for John Kennedy. He also practiced two things that the great presidential communicators practiced, suppression and going around the press. Going around the press, well, that was through his extraordinary televised news conferences, which I dare say many people on this, on this Zoom chat will remember. They were masterful. I watched every one of them again, whether he was spinning off policy issues um, through his great ability to recollect when he was doing something we don't see very often, taking responsibility for the Bay of Pigs with his famous statement, success has many fathers, but defeat is an orphan, or whether he was jousting with reporters or having a laugh with one reporter he always called on when he felt that the news conferences were dragging. Her name was Mae Craig, and she was a veteran even of the Roosevelt era press conferences when she was one of two women in that big gaggle of journalists. May Craig, older than elderly, wearing a flower pot hat so Kennedy would find her in the vast audiences in the State Department auditorium, which were used for the press conferences. She could always be relied on to ask a kind of an offbeat question. And Kennedy, all he would have to do is just smile politely while she was asking, and the press corps would begin to laugh. Whatever he said, there was a giant outburst of laughter. Uh, the Kennedy wit probably became legendary during these press conferences. Now, Kennedy did not always have an easy relationship with the press. He was furious that some journalists wanted to break the news of the Bay of Pigs, um, and he used all his power to convince them to hold the news. But then when the invasion in Cuba failed, he blamed the press for not bringing to his attention the fact that the plan for the invasion was fatally flawed. <coughs> he then appeared before the National Publishers Association at the Waldorf Astoria. And um, in that appearance, he told the publishers, I was going to call this speech, the president versus the press, but I decided to give you the benefit of the doubt and call it the president's and the press. He then proceeded to outline that when the interests of the country and the interests of a free press are at odds, then the interests of the country prevail. <coughs> Excuse me. I had been calling my book The Presidents and the Press up to that time, but inspired by JFK, I changed the title to The Presidents versus the Press. Well, I don't want to use up all the time. I do want to hear your questions, and I hope you'll submit questions to the Q&A chat. But of course, we have a few more presidents to cover in brief. And of course, I talk about Lyndon Johnson, who, who yearned 
for the kind of lionization that he felt Kennedy had, who did press conferences everywhere he could think of except the State Department so that he could forge his own kind of brand with the press. He even held a press conference standing on a hay, now what do you call it? Not a hay law, a hay bale at the LBJ ranch. He once took journalists on a tour of his ranch house at the LBJ ranch over Mrs. Johnson's objections. She locked herself in the bedroom and wouldn't let him in, but he demanded that she open the door and the press was treated to an unmade bed and a bathroom whose floor was littered with wet towels with hair curlers um, lying on the sink. Um, it usually didn't work. Things became more serious. Of course, it was not just the, the gaucheries showing his gallbladder scar, lifting his shirt up at Walter Reed Hospital to show his scar, or lifting his dogs up by the ears, which became a, a national sensation. It was what was called the credibility gap. The fact that the press began to realize that some of the information they were getting on innocuous things like the federal budget and ultimately, of course, the Vietnam War were flawed and phony. It destroyed Johnson. And he believed that the press destroyed him. As he said after Walter Cronkite's famous documentary from Vietnam, calling for an honorable peace and withdrawal, Johnson turned to his aides and said, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost middle America. I got to interview Joe Califano, a member of the Roosevelt House Advisory Board, about his days as a young press aide in the White House. Califano said, Johnson's ear was always on a transistor radio, his eyes glued to the three television networks when the national news came on. And he even had a ticker in his office. Now there's a vanished uh, technology, a wire ticker so that he could read the news as it came in. He was obsessed, but ultimately his obsession helped crush him. The press turned against Johnson and he left office. Richard Nixon, where do you begin? Richard Nixon had a volatile love, well, it wasn't love, it was a hate-hate relationship with the press from the time he entered politics as a candidate for Congress in uh, California. All during his prosecution, some say persecution, of Alger Hiss. Um, in 1962, he lost a comeback bid after losing the presidency to John Kennedy. He lost a comeback bid for governor of California to Jerry Brown's father and um, held a famous news conference at which he said, gentlemen, you don't have Nixon to kick around anymore because this is my last news conference. He then proceeded to excoriate the press for covering him, not in a straight way, as he said. Well, when he returned to power as president in 1969, he carried that longtime animus for journalists with him. And he set Spiro Agnew out uh, through the countryside to criticize the nattering nabobs of negativity in such a way that no White House had ever made press coverage an issue. Uh, a, another precedent for our own times. Nixon railed against cable commentators, against editorial writers. Um, he stopped taking the Washington Post. He criticized Catherine Graham. It was brutal. And meanwhile, the Vietnam War was escalating and he was coming under increased scrutiny for failing to fulfill his promise to bring an end to the long fighting in Southeast Asia. The Pentagon Papers case hardly endeared Nixon to the publishers as he fought for transparency in that case, nor did the enemies list, um, which included many, many journalists um, Mary McGrory was told by her friend Daniel Shore, Mary, you've made the enemies list. It says that you write an anti-Nixon column every day. And she said, that's absurd. I do no such thing. My column only runs three times a week. Daniel Shore later said that his lecture fees increased exponentially because he made 
the enemies list. But of course, all that jousting um, paled before the press pushback after the Watergate break-in and the cover-up. And I think this changed presidential coverage, again, not to overuse the word, exponentially. After Woodward and Bernstein, every journalist in the White House press corps, I think, dreamed of securing multi-million dollar book contracts, selling 600,000 books in a week, uh, and being portrayed in the movies by uh, Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman. That's about as good as it gets for guys. Bob Woodward is still at it 50 years later with his latest book and his coverage. Um, but after that, I think gotcha journalism took hold. The Nixon era changed things. For, for the, not for the better, but for all time, I fear. I interviewed Bill Clinton for the book, and though he bears, I think, remarkably little bitterness about his encounters with the press and acknowledges that he made some serious mistakes, not just for fabricating or not telling the truth about the Monica Lewinsky affair, but early in the administration, ordering the door locked between the White House press room and the press secretary's office. Used to be open season between them, but the Clintons did not want journalists roaming through the executive wing. So they closed it down and Clinton said, big mistake. He doesn't think there would have been Travelgate or Whitewater or the episode that he regards with bitterness, the questions about his friend Vincent Foster's suicide had it not been for that ill-advised effort. And yes, of course, um, the impeachment hearings we can debate those forever, but they created a new level of uh, gavel to gavel, 24 hour coverage of the president as cable news, meanwhile, finds a way uh, to analyze and regurgitate on a continuing basis. I would, I'll, I'll, I'll move quickly to, uh, because of the time for the narrative part of this discussion is drawing to a close. I do want to touch on Barack Obama and um, inevitably, inescapably, Donald Trump. I, I've been asked, what is the most surprising thing you found in your research? And I have to say, it was the level of bitterness that the press have about Barack Obama. This has nothing to do with political sensibility or accomplishments or appeal. It has to do with Obama's level of secrecy which they likened to earlier presidencies. Obama does still boast about the transparency of his administration, but he also um, instituted something of a crusade to find the source of leaks. He particularly went after two journalists who unfortunately, and I say this as a writer, not, not as a, a journalist, but um, had almost the same name, James Risen and James Rosen. It just makes for a very complicated narrative flow to keep those stories separate. In the case of one of them, I think it was Risen, he not only wiretapped the reporter, but his family as well, determined to find the source of leaks, invoking the 1918 Espionage Act in suppressing and withholding news. But again, as a genius communicator who went outside the realm of the press corps, Barack Obama created, his administration created the White House website. Journalists didn't like it when they asked the press secretary's office for questions and they referred him to a posting on the website. This is one of the reasons why many journalists that are, whose, whose recollections I read believed that they were not given fair and open access during Barack Obama's administration. And inevitably that brings us to Donald Trump. Where does one begin? His early career was filled with uh, public relations stunts, late night calls to newspapers in his own voice or the voice of uh, a putative press secretary who was in fact himself, seeking coverage on everything from his real estate deals to his romantic conquests. Um, but nothing like 
his presidency in terms of the press has ever been seen before in terms of its relentless making of the press as a major issue. However, looked at in a different way, this is George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, um, not even to the X factor, but continued and revived. He hasn't jailed any journalists like Abraham Lincoln. He hasn't even prosecuted them, although he talks about it all the time, like John Adams. He hasn't prevented the dissemination of news like Barack Obama, Franklin Roosevelt, and Woodrow Wilson. All he does is complain. I sort of think in one way that he treats the press like he treats the coronavirus. It's an annoying inconvenience um, and it can be deadly, but he doesn't quite know how to organize to suppress it. Thank goodness. Um, I'm not being partisan. I'm trying to be realistic because I also credit Donald Trump with an undisputable triumph in the manner of FDR and Kennedy and the best communicators, he has found a means to go around the press to escape its scrutiny through the World Wide Web with 70 or 80 million followers on Twitter. He has mastered a completely new communications medium. Maybe the Washington Post is right that he has told 20,000 lies in three and a half years as president, but as interpreted to his 70 million followers on Twitter, it doesn't have the impact that it might have if journalists were the ones filtering, interpreting, and reporting the message alone. It's a new world. The most corrosive effect that Donald Trump has had, of course, is the drip, drip of questioning the impartiality and the professionalism of journalists. The phrase, the enemies of the people is right out of Joseph Goebbels and Joseph Stalin. That part is to be regretted. The raising of questions about objective truth is to be regretted. I'm not even sure that we'll ever recover a uniform common uh, belief system around which we can all concur. That's the frightening part. And I write about that as, as openly as I do about his communications prowess. Where will it end? Well, ultimately, even though surveys show that the reputation of the press is low, the reputation of the courts is low, the presidency, the post office, the military, we're at a moment when all the pillars of Republican government with small r are being questioned as never before since the, since the Civil War. My hope is that independent journalism, in whatever form it takes in the future, whatever platform it uses to communicate news, un unfiltered news, eventually triumphs and unites us around a common set of truth, if not values. That's the job of journalism, to be, as Chom Thomas Jefferson said, even if he didn't believe it, the toxin of liberty the warning bell against tyranny and despotism. But presidents have been fighting with the press since George Washington, and I think it will continue. Our job is to make sure that we remember that at its best, the conflict can be healthy and can guarantee the honesty of the presidency and the professionalism of journalism moving forward. And as Donald Trump would say, I hate to quote him at the end, but I will. We'll see what happens. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Harold, for that journey through history um, with the lens of journalism. How fascinating. We have uh, a, a series of wonderful questions here. So I'm going to start off with uh, one from Barbara, who writes, given your historical perspective, should we be optimistic about the effects of Trump's pillaring of the press? Um, maybe hopeful is better than optimistic, more realistic than optimistic. Um, I just simply remind people that these corrosive attacks have taken place before. Adams um, insisted that any journalism that criticized him uh, or his political party was not only 
inaccurate was not only unacceptable, but it was worthy of prosecution. Lincoln brooked no criticism of the Union war effort in the North. Um, he sicked the military, the State Department, the Post Office Department, uh, the Interior Department, and his own White House and the War Department against journalists who advise against the draft, who advise against recruitment, and some who merely criticize the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, through it all, independent dissenting journalism has survived. Uh, so I, I do have, I, I, I already said I wouldn't use the word, um, I wouldn't be too confident, but I have the expectation that journalism in whatever technology it, it, um, it embraces going, going into the future will continue to push back. Um, I know it seems like we're bitterly divided, but um, journalism will help us eventually to an objective truth. It depends where it, uh, um, and that part I'm reasonably confident in. On that note, building on that, Carol asks that um, given the impact of social media as a po powerful force influencing citizens today, can you comment on how you feel this will impact our upcoming election and the press? Well, I'm hopeful that outright fabrications are going to be scrutinized and erased from Facebook, which I think may be the worst offender in terms of allowing trolls and crazy charges to live on the web. What worries me is how quickly these things are reposted. You know, within, within minutes, hundreds of thousands of people get access to um, conspiracy theories and, uh, and the like. I guess as a society, we're going to have to revisit the issue of free and open dissemination of information. Where do we draw the line? Do we draw the line at the way uh, Germany does at Holocaust denial and glorification of the Nazi history of Germany? Or do we draw no lines in the United States? Um, I, think th I think we're heading to a period where there's gonna have to be some oversight of the technology. There's just too much crazy QAnon and Russian uh, bots out there. I think it'll come. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if the tech giants know how to do it yet, but I think for their own security in terms of their economic dominance, they, they're gonna have to find a way. So the answer is, look, I, I visited um, a number of campuses last year while I was researching the book to talk about Lincoln and the press as I was preparing this book for publication. And I always ask audiences um, how they get their news. And I have to say, I don't know whether it's surprising, shocking, or dispiriting. Um, the older people, who the adult learners in the classes would always say, the Wall Street Journal online, the, the New York Times. Um, nobody seems to get neighborhood newspapers anymore, or even local papers. Um, but the kids are all over the place. Um, Breitbart. Um, I remember someone said they, uh, they get news from Agence France Press online. And he wasn't a French speaker. There's an English, and one said the BBC. Why? Because they don't trust any platforms in the United States. So I don't know what worries me more. Uh, the, the outlying crazy reports or the fact that there's no more Walter Cronkite around which, or a fireside chat around which everyone in a family coalesces to get a common, to get common ground. Everybody is out there on, on, uh, on their own devices, no pun intended. Right. And you touched on the, the question of security and Naomi asks, um, first she says, there have been instances where the press has knowledge of coming events and they don't publish them because of national security and asks, do you think that this would happen today because of Trump's animosity towards the press? I think it was a, if, it's a, if it's a genuine national security issue and not a fabricated one, uh, the press would be extremely careful. I don't think the Espionage Act has ever been, um, has ever sunset. So it's out there ominously hanging 
like a cloud over journalists and can, can always be repurposed the way President Obama did during the war on terrorism, as it was called. So I have faith that if, if things are really on the line. Um, also, um, White Houses do have to figure out how to handle the media in terms of controlling the leaking of information. I think Trump world has a way now of keeping things quiet. We'll see when the name of uh, the Supreme Court nominee is, is disseminated. It will, I mean, it's, it's Friday as we speak. It's supposed to be announced um, tomorrow, but it will be leaked out, um, you know, officially and intentionally an hour or so before. So that's a pretty closely guarded secret. Of course, with President Trump, you never really know when he's actually making decisions. So the uh, idea of things leaking out is not as, uh, not as frightening as it is under, with presidents who plan very carefully. So I noticed that in all the last four questions, my answers have not been definitive, but it's, uh, you know, we're still living, we're living in uncharted territory in many ways. Absolutely. Um, I think Barbara's other question is a good um, segue from, from what you were just speaking about. She says, granted that there has always been conflict between presidents and the press, what do you think of the constant coverage of Trump, especially on cable TV, on both sides of the political spectrum in the sense that any publicity is good publicity? And this is in many ways keeping Trump front and center, regardless of, she writes, his immoral and outrageous behavior. Well, I have to say, I, I, I mean, I, I guess my, my own political leanings are not a secret. So I felt this very strongly in 2016. I felt that the constant, I don't want to say gavel to gavel, but you know what I mean, coverage of Trump's rallies um, created a sense of momentum, even though he lost the popular vote. I think it was harmful. Um, um, look, if, if, if candidates do events, they should be covered. I don't believe in um, repressing the news of a political campaign. I think in, in terms of the moment, Vice President Biden has to decide what kind of campaign events he's going to do in the last month of the campaign. And um, will people get the impression that one guy is out there and screaming and carrying on without a mask? Um, uh, is he being courageous or is he endangering his crowds? That's the decision people will make. When, when Joe Biden appears with a mask and does a small event, does that mean he can't get crowds? Or is he being careful and sensible in the midst of a pandemic that may be getting worse? People, I, I think people have to, we have to be grown up and let people make their own decisions. And maybe connected to that, Randy asks, um, have publishers ever been objective towards politicians and presidents? And um, if you have any examples of publications, he's curious to, to know. The well, yeah, um, really the, the person who changed the way journalists view, politic, uh, view um, politics, politicians and presidents was Adolf Ox, first in Chattanooga and then when he bought the New York Times um, in the 1890s. The Times was founded by Henry J. Raymond in 1851. As its initial brochure said, we are going to be a Republican newspaper. By the time Ox took it over, he created the idea that they would publish only the news that was fit to print and all of it, and that opinions would be reserved for the editorial column. And I think for many years, the Times transformed journalism and made even, let's say, the Chicago Tribune, which hated Roosevelt, they may have editorially railed against him, but they, they, were, they were objective in covering the news. Um, so there were times. Publishers had editorial animus. Let's look back at the Daily News in New York. They were controlled by the same family as owned the Chicago Tribune. And in World War II, they began opposing Roosevelt in everything. But they're also the newspaper that raised money for the White House pool uh, that presidents used in some instances in ways we don't want to even think about. Um, but Roosevelt used it for rehabilitation and for exercise uh, and uh, inviting reporters to join him. Um, so it cuts both ways, but there was a period 
when the story was more important than the opinion, I think. And Millicent's curious if you have any um, insight on Ronald Reagan, the great communicator, and his relationships with the press. I guess I'm grateful that we can go back 30 years instead of dwelling on Trump. Yeah, I did. Of course, I wrote a chapter on Reagan, who is, um, you know, a fascinating subject uh, for analysis as a, a in terms of his relations with the media, which started out badly with accusations that his campaign had stolen some of Jimmy Carter's briefing books uh, to prepare him for his debates, but warmed understandably when uh, he was the, the subject of an assassination attempt early in his presidency, uh, a, an assassination attempt that ended the professional career of his press secretary, James Brady. So there was, there was a residue of goodwill, even though the press was, was kind of being snookered. Um, Reagan had an issue of the day that he focused on. He, he created um, a panoply or his staff a panoply of press opportunities to show him relaxed, confident, in command. Um, with Reagan, uh, uh, one of the illustrations in my book shows you didn't just have a, uh, uh, a physical fitness day, you had a photo op with Reagan uh, using barbells to show how physically fit he was. At the same time, he developed a technique that sometimes I wish President Trump would uh, embrace, where when he was walking to the helipad for a trip, and reporters shouted out questions rather than walk over to the rope line and engage and fight with them as Trump does. He would cup his ear uh, as if to suggest he couldn't hear their questions or point to his watch to suggest he had no time. Why did he get away with it? Because he was an actor. That's, he was pantomiming, I can't hear and I have no time. Speaking of acting, when he was briefing for press conferences, very often he would, well, always he would get briefing books, but so did John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and Bill Clinton. But he would often rewrite the briefing books in longhand. And I looked for the explanation and that was apparently the way he learned his lines in his movie days, by re just writing the scripts in longhand. He was a, a facile writer and a good writer on his own. And we forget that, just look at the diaries. And let's face it, a natural, natural performer before the cameras. Uh, no one was as gifted as Reagan, um, except maybe for Kennedy. And, um, and, and he parlayed that charm. Of course, he lost some of his mojo late in his second term. And uh, with the Iran-Contra scandal, he, he blundered uh, and bumbled his way through the late press conferences. Um, but I think there has never been as brilliant a press operation as the Reagan press operation. And I'm just looking at the time. Um, I think this might be our last question for you. Okay. So uh, Daniel asks that, well, he states, my impression is that people are quite alarmed by Trump's attacks on the press, though you note that his attacks are not as effectual or intense as some of those of the past. Have our attitudes changed? Do you have a sense of how disturbed people were at the time of Jackson, Lincoln, other presidents uh, compared with the press or paired with the press? Well, I, b before going back and answering the historical question, I will concede that <laughs> seeing this every day, you know, in real time on CNN or MSNBC or Fox or on, online is more impactful than reading about it the next day or in the 19th century uh, the next week. Uh, but in the 19th century, that's what passed for immediate news. So I think it's hard to judge the impact uh, on the basis of immediate gratification. If you look back at the editorial responses to presidential crackdowns, they were intense. They were not reserved. Um, Democratic journalists risking their own freedom and their enterprises were brutally attacked Abraham Lincoln as a tyrant, a despot, uh, a man who was trampling the Constitution. Um, they risked their livelihoods, their, the, their access to their audiences, but there was absolutely um, intense criticism of the subjugation of the press, um, maybe less so during world wars. What Lincoln counted on and got, and this maybe will strike 
a familiar note, is that he could count on the Republican media, the New York Times, the New York Tribune, to write uh, in defense of his crackdown on press freedom, um, even against their own interests, even though they were setting precedents that could be used against them during Democratic administrations. They wrote that freedom of the press was not an absolute, it was not guaranteed, and Lincoln was right. So we have been through these times before. I mean, I know it's um, kind of wimpy to say this too shall pass, but um, the pendulums have a way of swinging in American history. Um, and um, again, if we believe that the judiciary is, is being stacked on one side of the political spectrum and it will impact us for generations, then maybe the, the media will be just the toxin of liberty that Thomas Jefferson hoped it would be in theory. Wonderful place to end. Um, I, I would dare to say optimistic or hopeful. Um, thank you so much, Harold. And You're thank welcome. you everyone for joining us today. I, before bringing Leslie back up to give her closing remarks, I just want to alert those who attended to look out for a survey about today's event. Um, and that will be sent via email to the address that you registered with. And Leslie, if you'd like to come back up with us and send us off with um, dates to mark our calendars. Great, absolutely. Thank you, Harold. That was a wonderful way to start this new program and, and you've set a hard, high bar and we very much hope you will join the IRP at some point. Um, our next event, um, this is the schedule for the fall, October 30th, November 20th, and December 4th. So mark your calendars and we'll be in touch with you shortly with some more, um, with some more information. Thank you all for coming and thank you so much, Harold. Bye.